Hi there, I'm Lindsay Porter of Yoga New You, yoga teacher, well-being advocate and one of the things that's keeping me going through these uh, current quite challenging times is coming once a week and dipping into this beautiful lock for my wild water swim and I think it is about finding things that just help keep you sane, maybe uh, keep something alive within you if you like. So for this month's newsletter I thought what does everybody love? Everybody loves a story. So I thought maybe I would share you a chapter of the book that I wrote and it took me 10 years to bring all these stories together. And I thought I'd share it with you, not because I want you to understand my story and where I'm from, but perhaps in my story, you can see something that uh, rekindles something in you, something you've done in your life, um, or perhaps gives you that element of, oh yeah, let's do something like that um, or something similar. So please enjoy, keep well and look forward to touching base with you soon. Namaste. A Leech of an Adventure, 1997, age 24, Nepal. It often seems to be the right of the young to be gung-ho and plunge into things like an adventure halfway around the world without very much precision or organisation around the important details. That's how my epic two-week experience in Nepal seemed to unfold. Like Enid Blyton's famous five tales of adventure that I read growing up, the five of us, but no dogs in this case, Carlos, Linda, Ajit or Aj, Anita and myself set off with enthusiasm, seeking adventure. Two guys and three girls, all working in London, some of us at the same bank on a graduate management trainee scheme. We came together as a group of work colleagues, friends and friends of friends. And when Linda came on board to join our unfolding expedition, she grabbed the whole trek to Nepal idea by the horns and I believe was the first to head out and buy the Lonely Planet Traveller's Bible on Nepal. Always a good first step. I think from that point on, I felt everything was sorted and would simply fall into place. I remember the first time I thumbed through my own copy of Lonely Planet with any intent. It was on the flight to Kathmandu. And despite the lack of team planning, it miraculously came together in an ad hoc kind of way, the right of the young approach working well, and it became one of the most fulfilling experiences of my life at that time. It also included one of the more memorable flying experiences. We had purchased our plane tickets from the various dubious bucket travel shops around London. Dubious to the extent I remember Carlos returning to his one day with a question about travel insurance to find the office had vanished into thin air. The flights held fast, but via an interesting route. Boarding the Aeroflot plane at Heathrow, I thought the poor reputation of the Russian national carrier was bestowed unfairly. We had a smooth flight in a modern plane into Moscow. The rest becomes a little fuzzy in my memory, probably for good reason. I understand from the others, many vodkas and gin and tonics were consumed in the Moscow Transit Lounge. Ah, the joys of youth. If it had been now, you most probably would see me rolling out my yoga mat and sipping water. We then flew via a dizzying number of Middle Eastern countries, taking off and landing every few hours. My tension began to rise with every touchdown as I kept thinking the odds of us crashing were increasing each time. The rest of the passengers must have shared this sense of rising panic, as on every landing there erupted an enthusiastic round of applause, the first time I had ever seen this happen on a flight. It didn't take long to notice that on our flights after Moscow there was a distinct lack of cabin crew and the usual electrical gadgetry visible in the cabin, replaced instead with a lot of peeling off stickers. There was no sense of flight routine, no fasten seat belt check or any instruction about life belts or oxygen masks the latter I felt I already needed. Passengers were freely wandering around the cramped cabin, cramped because bags were piled up anywhere and everywhere. Many had come prepared with their own refreshments and were drinking directly from large bottles of vodka. I believe these people were the frequent flyer contingent and we should probably have followed their lead in finding the most comfortable way to endure the flight. Grateful for being alive, we descended through some spectacularly massive cloud formations into the mystical, timeless city of Kathmandu. As a bonus, our luggage arrived too. What a treat of a place to be in as our passing through, stopping over place in Nepal. We decamped from the airport into what I recall as being a tuk-tuk type vehicle, but I'm not sure how that could have been possible 
what with five of us and five big backpacks. Surely we didn't all fit into one. What is clearer was Adj insisted on using his Hindi to negotiate the price and sort out where we were heading to, to find a place for the night. However, his valiant, insistent linguistic efforts kept being met with a tuk-tuk driver responding in English. It became rather comical to watch both persisting in using their international language skills. We eventually found somewhere, cheap, and after spending a day or two soaking up the amazing temples, the cheeky monkeys, local colourful customs, and the generally laid-back ambience of the city, we headed westward. We spent two adrenaline-soaked days on the Kali Gandaki River, meaning the River of God. It is said this river is older than the Himalayas. We decided to do some whitewater rafting and camping en route. What a scream, all the way down. From there, we travelled on to the second largest city in Nepal, Pokhara. It felt more like being in a small town. Here is where many mountaineering, hiking, climbing routes up into the Annapurna range of the Himalayas start. We rocked up with our rucksacks and started walking. In hindsight, I'm guessing someone, it wasn't me, had figured out how long it would take us, how we were going to sustain ourselves for the duration, i.e. eating and sleeping, and which flight we needed to book in advance to return us from up on high to Pokhara in seven days' time. My guess would it would be organised Linda, as after all, she was working in human resources at the time. I had first met Linda through the bank graduate training scheme we were both on, and later we ended up working in the same part of the bank, in its internal management consultancy division. I instantly liked being around her, drawn to her no-nonsense, energetic, can-do approach to life. We also became known as looky-likeys, as many people thought and still think we look very similar. When I met her brother for the first time at her wedding, he couldn't get over how much I looked like his sister. It's relatively easy to tell us apart, though. She's quite a bit taller than me. Off we started on our trek, and somewhat to my amazement, and more so because I'm writing this in hindsight, not one of us seemed to have given any thought to carrying all our belongings ourselves along the entire route, or taking any walking support aids such as a walking pole. And not a sniff of a guide either. I think the most medical thing we used for the entire trek was a tubi grip for a sore knee. And if I were back there now, I would award us all a big medal for that feat alone. Another shining example of the right of the young to succeed despite a lack of any planning. As you would expect, the views were stunning, but what I didn't expect was the variety of terrain. We encountered lush green hillsides, Canadian-like pine forests, deep gorges with crushing, torrid waters, and increasingly barren landscapes the higher we traversed. I remember our surroundings a little more clearly than I might have otherwise due to the noticeable lack of high, snow-covered mountain peak vistas. We had planned to take our trip in early September, when the monsoon is typically receding, and just before the annual hordes of trekkers pour into the region. It was our cunning plan, one of the few we had thought about, to be crowd-free and have the views to ourselves. It was pleasingly fairly quiet throughout our route. However, the monsoon was carrying on for longer than usual, meaning lots of clouds and not many views. It was also unexpectedly very active and busy on the leech front, due to the rains that were still raging. I think from day one we were forced to adopt a mindset of being ready to brace ourselves and counter-attack these blood-sucking creatures. I remember feeling a little smug though when we heard that leeches also hang down from the tree leaves and as you walk under them they sense your body heat and drop, finding a way from their drop zone to get under your clothing and attach themselves onto your skin. I say smug because I had used up some of my precious weight allowance on taking an umbrella. It turned out to be a stroke of genius. It became my protector from leech aerial assaults, as well as my handy on-the-go portaloo door. As we progressed along the Johnson Drow towards our destination, which was the small and fragile-looking Johnson airstrip, we worked our way through all the tried and tested methods of removing leeches. Our firm favourite became the adrenaline fueled reactive yank with a pair of tweezers. Not the recommendation you read in any guidebook, but certainly our preference. Setting them on fire and watching leeches explode with your blood in them, not great, especially for us vegetarians. Salt takes far too long and seemed largely ineffective. Lighting a burning cigarette was just an annoyance because we didn't smoke. And so the tweezer yank through trial and error it was. Apart from with Adj, that is. Adj's key investment in a piece of trekking kit had been a pair of gaiters. And whilst the rest of us battled with the leeches, he sauntered along claiming he was untouchable. 
so it was met with some hilarity, mainly on our part, when Ash decided to unzip a gator partway through one particular wet day to find about eight leeches feasting on his lower leg. Chaos ensued, sucking up his calmness in one quick moment. It's hard to imagine ever becoming used to leeches. On a positive note, this experience with leeches helped cure and put into a much better perspective my rational fear of spiders for many years afterwards. I like to think that Adji's love of the tea houses on that trip triggered what he now does for a living. Just recently, in 2018, I saw Adji again for the first time in over 10 years. I was in London to hear the teachings of and interview face-to-face -face Jetsumna Tenzin Palmo, one of the most senior Buddhist female monks in the world. Meeting her and hearing her insights was an incredible experience and one that I'm planning to share in my next book. En route to Rigpa, the Tibetan Buddhist meditation centre, to meet Jetsumna, I found time to stop in and visit Adji's newly opened and beautiful tea shop, Camellias, which is situated just opposite the British Museum on Great Russell Street. Adj left banking to follow his passion for tea, and in doing so has become the UK's first ITEIA Master Tea Sommelier. Back to the tea houses in Nepal. During our trek, such was the cloudy, wet weather that when we reached the place where you can take a short side trek to enjoy Poon Hill's panoramic viewpoint of the Annapurna range, we didn't even bother going to check. I think at this point we were preoccupied attempting to dry our damp woolen socks and pongy clothing on a tiny but incredibly smoky fire fuelled by yak dung. We were all desperate to get something at least partially dry to wear for the day ahead. We'd already given up on wearing anything that smelt okay. We plodded up and we plodded down jagged stone steps, squeezed past fierce looking but generally docile yaks sharing the pathways and somehow we managed to keep our sense of humour in the face of ongoing leech alerts. Lunch became a daily two to three hour affair. At every stopping place we found menus offering a surprising variety of dishes but commonly all prepared and cooked over one twig of fire. Everything seemed to come back to chewy yak cheese and although we all seemed to fancy chips at every meal, we gradually learned that these took an age to cook and we were better off not ordered. The only meal definitely worth ordering was dal bart, the local dish made from lentils with rice. Quick, easy, nutritious and no yak cheese in sight. Apples here, apples there, apples everywhere. The higher we went, the more apples we came across. Apple everything on the menu. Apple porridge became a firm favourite. Even to the extent that on our tiny plane back from Jompson, jammed under every seat and in every available nook and cranny were bags of apples being taken back down to the mountain to be sold. About midway through our trek, after another full day of walking, I remember we reached Tatapani, a magical little settlement. We had heard about its natural hot springs and we were all of one mind heading straight to the little walled off pool to check it out. We spontaneously ditched our rucksacks and plunged in, most of us fully clothed. It was pure bliss, and for once I think we all smelt okay the following day. It was the next morning in Tatapani that for the first time we were blessed with a view of snow-capped mountains whilst eating our breakfast, of apple porridge of course. It may have been a glimpse of the Dalagiri Massive, the pointed peak of Nilgiri, at an impressive 7,000 metres high, and possibly Dalagiri 1 itself, the seventh highest mountain in the world at just over 8,000 metres from sea level. Whatever it was, it was breathtaking. This is what I had come for, endured endless aeroflot flights for, bravely fought off leeches for, and I was not disappointed. One or two glimpses of these majestic peaks were truly awesome. Turns out this trip became the start of a whole load of adventures for Carlos too. He returned to the same area in 1999 and completed the entire Annapurna circuit, a 22-day trek around the summit peak, about 140 miles long. Sadly, Carlos reports that the Tatapani, our hot spring haven, just a year later was an utterly different place, following a landslide and flood that reshaped it. Plus, a new road had been constructed all the way to Jompsom, making trekkers share the way with vehicles on their fumes. Somewhere along our journey, we all developed a great group companionship. I remember sharing a lot of laughs and jokes and being given the nickname Dynamo, but I can't remember why. I think I'll go with a vague recollection of being pretty fit and enthusiastically bounding along the many paths, ascents and descents. Or is this just my wishful thinking? Overall, Nepal is a stunning place and one that I hope to return to someday. 
my aim is to capture a few more of those magnificent views of the white mountains of the Himalayas and hopefully encounter a few less of those awful leeches. So, Carlos, Adj, Linda, Anita, I imagine it a bit like the Star Wars movie, The Force Awakens, where Han Solo and Princess Leia reunite after many years. Just let me know when you're ready. Linda can then sort out getting the latest Lonely Planet edition. We can go with a digital version this time. And I'll go and invest in some sturdy walking poles, dynamo on sticks. Anita could just go in her running shoes after her recent amazing London marathon triumphs. And Adj can decide if he still has faith in using gaiters. Carlos can buy his ticket from a decent travel agent this time. And we can all invest more time in planning all aspects of the trip. Planning. That's the right of being older, don't you know? Life lessons learned. Be bold, be naive, and lap up all the experiences life offers you. Build memories that you can look back on later in life and truly appreciate. song is, uh, is very much about pilgrimage as well. So you can if you want to, I mean I always feel it when I sing this, feel yourself going across the, the great Tibetan plains in between mountains. Extraordinary large mountains either side of you. Anyway, we'll come back to the minor Bible. After many months of travelling We finally reached the mountains of the moon Finding the mother of pilgrims One by one into this wilderness's room With the bread of life We linger on the rose of love that gives us freedom to roam like our forefathers did. We watch the demons without and within and holds us to the soul. Blessings have been received. We all set off towards our home. 